Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my life.
that you would save us is such a cause. And we're so amazed, and we give you praise for the power of the cross. Oh, we're so amazed, and we're so amazed. Aren't you so amazed? The power of the cross. Amen. I've been saved 47 plus years and I'm still amazed. Amen. God would have mercy on wretches and people that have made an absolute disaster of their lives. And yet, uh, amen, his love and grace reaches down to where we are and lifts us up. And so we're very happy to be able to come before the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and present our needs, our desires. We're going to open in prayer and we're going to believe God. Uh, we just have a couple of uh, needs that we want to bring before God. We want to continue to remember our sister Lucy Mitchell, who's uh, had some uh, physical issues and uh, that she's working through. It was in the hospital, and we want to believe God for God's grace on her. Also, Luis Cota Jr., two years old in the hospital. He's been sick for eight days. He can't eat solids. Uh, he's losing weight. Uh, so we want to bring him before the throne of grace. Uh, we want to pray for uh, the United States states. We want to pray for Arizona. We want to pray for Tucson, the leaders that God would visit. Uh, and uh, amen. I, I love what Pastor Warner said is that he still is believing for this country for a fresh outpouring of the spirit and revival. Amen. I'm not sure if you saw it, but one of the top Cities uh, raided in the United States, Tucson, Arizona. Amen. Uh, I believe that it's Tucson's hour for a new move of God. Amen. So we want to believe God. We want to contend. want to pray for our leaders that God's grace would be on the service anointing on, uh, amen, Pastor Stevens as he ministers. Uh, if you have a need, a burden, lift it before God. Amen. He can touch you right now, right where you're at. Uh, and maybe our brother Jose Urbina will come and just seal this for us in prayer. Let's ask God to help us. Amen. Father, by the blood of Jesus, uh, we come to you, God, in faith, knowing that you are mighty and able. Not all things, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, our eyes are upon you, O oh God, like a handmaiden's eyes are upon her mistress, and, uh, and the servant's eyes are upon his master. Father, our eyes are upon you to behold, O oh God, the, the power, the grace, the mercies, O oh God, that you can be so upon your people. Father, we come humbly to you. And we ask you to intervene in each and every life that was mentioned. Our sister Lucy Mitchell and, and our city, our state, our country, Father. And the witness that, that you have put in our culture, Father. I ask you to bless uh, uh, Pastor Stevens uh, that he will wax eloquent and become an oracle of God. That his words would be words uh, that heal, that comfort, that direct, that, that rebuke, that, that stir the heart, oh God. Not just us to sit, but to do something about it, oh God, that our prayers would have legs on them, and that we, oh God, would be involved uh, in, in all the things that you have called us to do, Father. We humbly ask you for that enablement, that anointing that would enable us to obey you and do your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 
You may be seated. Uh, we do want to take a moment to welcome everyone to our Sunday night service. Uh, as well, if you're on live stream, we're glad that you've been able to tune in with us. We had an outstanding morning this morning. Amen. A trip down memory lane. Uh, and uh, uh, amen. Pastor Stevens was sharing about some of the things that happened in the early days of the church and uh, how God touched his life as after we finished lunch, I drove by the park house. Amen. Because I, I lived there as well and uh, brought back some memories. Hallelujah. Uh, look what the Lord has done. Amen. And it's uh, going to be a great uh, service tonight. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Tomorrow night for the men uh, at 730 p.m., there is a men's discipleship class. Is it 7.30 or 7? I got confused. <laughs> My notes say 7.30, so I'm going with that. 7.30 tomorrow night, area-wide men's discipleship class. Some people are saying 7, and so be here at 7. If you're too early, you can pray. Hallelujah. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, Wednesday night is our midweek service. Uh, we're continuing on the book of uh, Romans and our study. And uh, amen. Uh, chapter 11 deals with Israel and its future. And so we're going to be looking at the thought of dispensation. And uh, uh, amen. That will be a key to understanding the future that God has for the church and for for the nation of Israel, so come and be part of that. Uh, also, we're looking ahead to uh, Saturday. There is going to be an impact team to the Door Church East. Uh, Pastor Carl and Norma Cooper there, helping them meeting at the church uh, at 10 a.m. So if you'll keep that in mind, uh, and if you're available, come and get involved. Let's help the Coopers. I was able to minister there just uh, about a month ago. Some good things are happening, and so we want to just give them an, uh, a boost and uh, help accelerate what God's already started there in that church. Uh, uh, just before we receive the offering, our brother Paul Orr is going to come. Nuevo Destino was able to minister in Mesa, Arizona, and so we're going to hear a report about that. God. Brother Jose Urbina leads the band Nuevo Destino. Gave me the privilege to talk tonight. But we went to Mesa, Arizona, pastored by Richard Romero. And uh, we had a great time. Four people got saved at that outreach. I believe they had six visitors. Four of those got saved. The other thing that was awesome that happened was 11th hours, my family band. We just started. Jose gave me a chance uh, to let my boys and my wife play a few songs to open up for Nuevo Destino, and so everybody was blessed. We had a great time, and I want to tell you, it's exciting serving God and doing what he's called you to do, so praise God, amen. Amen. What a beautiful thing as a fellowship that we are a fellowship, you know, and we help each other, we support, we get involved, and uh, a lot of people look and wonder, wow, how in the world could you have three over 3,000 churches? It's because we help each other, amen. When we send someone out, we don't just, uh, hasta la, bye-bye, you know, we don't just, we say, we're behind you, we're supporting, amen. And so as the ushers come, our giving is part of that support, amen. We invest, uh, we support, we help, uh, and uh, amen, the amount of money that goes out from the Tucson Church on a monthly basis is significant, uh, uh, and it's to help, uh, amen, the work of God in so many different places, and uh, you have a part in that, amen. You know, there will be an eternal reward. Think about the scripture, Proverbs eleven twenty five tells us that the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. You know, here is a person identified as a generous soul. Now, I don't know about you, but I would like to have that identity. You know, we talk often about that poor soul, you know, and really what that means is here's a person whose life is marked by misfortune, by trouble, uh, by bad things happening. But here in the scripture, it talks about a person who's identified as a generous soul. Their soul is generous. And because of that, they enter into this blessing. They're, they're a blessed soul. And, uh, you know, 
We give because we understand there's a financial advantage to giving. That's well documented. So, and, and you will reap. Give and it'll be given back to you. But uh, what sometimes we don't understand is there's more that happens in our giving than just the dollars. There is the spiritual realm that's entered into and, and this, our soul is enriched. It's, uh, it's made uh, generous, it's made joyful. And so I wanna encourage you to be a blessing. Let's give tonight uh, as our heads are bowed. Uh, amen, I'm gonna ask our brother, just to ask God's blessing. Praise the Lord. We are very blessed to have Pastor Paul Stevens uh, and his wife Renee with us uh, in our Jubilee celebration services. Uh, I think about Pastor Stevens and uh, the first way that he came to my attention, uh, who he was and his spirit was someone said, you know, I was driving downtown and I saw Paul Stevens on the corner. He was preaching all by himself. <laughs> and so, uh, amen, the preach is in him. And, uh, you know, I think Pastor Stevens is one person that, you, you know, if the PA system goes out, no problem. Amen. He can take care of it. He's, <laughs> he's got the preach inside of him. And so we're blessed to have him come. Uh, let's give him a warm welcome as he comes to minister tonight. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, I have the incredible honor of introducing Renee, Sister Renee, my wife. She's going to come now and testify briefly. Back in September, uh, I'm sure you know, Queen Elizabeth passed away. And I thought to myself, and all the things were going on surrounding Queen Elizabeth, who had been Queen of England for 70 years, uh, no disrespect to her, but she's not my queen. And you know, one of the characteristics of my wife, Renee, and people that know her well would say the same thing, is that she has a very unusual tenacity, meaning that once she makes up her mind on something, 
It's going to happen one way or another. This is how I got saved and I gave my life to Christ. It was her getting saved on that Sunday, as I shared with you this morning, and then her tenacity. She was going to get me saved and it only took four days. (laughs) And then some years later, when we were pastoring on Cape Cod, I got invited to go preach in England. And while we were there, we were preaching. I'm going back to Cape Cod to resume pastoring there. But God spoke to her that one day we were going to pioneer a church in in England. And she mentioned that to me, talked to me about that then. And I just kind of, okay, maybe later sometime. I don't know. Don't think so. But she never stopped talking to me about it for three years until we disembarked from a plane after having been given a one-way ticket to London, England in 1987. And then after we were there for seven and a half years, Pastor Warner called me while I was preaching a revival for Dave Ford. Pastor Dave was uh, pioneering a church in Liverpool, England, and I was there. Uh, It was uh, August, late August of 1994, Pastor Warner called me uh, about taking over the El Paso church. And so that was a shock to us because we'd made a decision that we wanted to stay overseas for the rest of our lives. That's what we had talked about the previous Tucson conference. And, and so that was what was in our hearts. The London church was just getting really good traction. We had numbers of disciples, a number of the, uh, the girls, young ladies in the church. Uh, uh, Sister Renee was uh, men- mentoring them. One of them, of course, uh, uh, was Emine Ajala. She was uh, about 15 or 16 at the time. And Pastor Warner called me, and I'm dumbfounded. I don't know what to do. And so I finished preaching that night for Dave, got in my car, drove five hours, uh, uh, because I got to talk to Renee. I got to talk to the queen and see what she wants to do. And I'm not sure what she's going to say. So we get home. I get home about 2 o'clock in the morning, and she's shocked that I'm there because I was supposed to preach, (coughs) excuse me, another couple of nights there. And I remember walking into the bedroom. She's surprised to see me. And I tell her what's going on. And she just, she sat up. That kind of glow that I described this morning, I remember she just kind of sat up. uh, And she said, Paul, we have to go. And she could barely get the words out because she was crying. But she immediately applied herself to what. Mr. Warner, and we were in El Paso uh, the next week. It was a quick turnaround. So, my queen, Sister Renee. Thank you. (laughs) My husband said this morning that we're just two people from our perspective, two regular people that are able to do what we do and have been able to do it all these years because of this church, because of Pastor Warner, because Pastor Mitchell had a vision and he sent Pastor Warner and Mona here because they obeyed the call of God. And any person in this place and any of the churches you have all over the world is because of the generosity of this congregation. You know, first of all, before I forget what I'm talking about, I just want to really thank all of you. There's so many of you, too many to name, that have been amazing, that every time we come to conference, it's just so stabilizing, so comforting to see you all here, to know that you pray for us. And it's an extension. I mean, every time you're someplace, there'll be somebody that will come up and mention something to us. A woman called Patty came up to me today and told me her son Christopher got saved in our our church that we sent out of El Paso. To uh, in Colorado, and I had never met her before, and she just said, you know, she started to cry, and she thanked us, but you know what? That's your fruit. You know, we just are doing, trying the best we can to figure out what God wants us to do. I'm not an upfront kind of person. This is terrifying (laughs) for me, but, but I have something inside me that wants to encourage you, no matter how old you are, that God can take you on a journey of a lifetime, even though there's not much lifetime left for some of us seniors here, but I believe Jesus is coming. 
But, I, you know, one thing I did want to mention that just pops in my mind all the time is gratitude and prayer. Because without prayer, I love this prayer sign outside your prayer room. Mass, I mean, how do you walk up and ignore that sign? I'm walking up this morning, it's like, wow, prayer first, prayer first. You know, that my focus, as long as my focus is on prayer, that's what keeps us going. That's our fuel that keeps us like with Jesus in front of us. And some of you have had much worse things happen in your lives. We've had crushing things happen in our life. But the only reason why we make it is because we pray, because we have a God in heaven that will take care of us and help us. And, and the older we get, it gets a little more challenging to figure out physically what we can do what can you know there's things we can't do that we used to be able to do physically last conference thank you for everyone that prayed for me I was crippled in pain I got a new hip and it's like it never happened I mean God is just so able to answer our prayers to give us what we don't deserve and he does it over and over and over again and our lives are a testimony of God just repeating and repeating that's what he wants to do and no matter how old or how young or how new you are in Jesus, Jesus is the answer. There is no other answer. People are going to hell in the, you know, by the droves, and we're the ones that have the answer. So I'm just so grateful, so, so grateful for all of you, for Pastor Warner and Mona, for this opportunity to just have the joy to be here, to be able to see what's going on here, and to tell you that don't be discouraged, don't be discouraged. There's people out there, we pray for you, and there's people that you don't even know until sometimes someone will come up and just say, hey, I've been praying for you, I, you've been on my mind. I mean, God's able to put somebody in your mind. If that's the most you can do, it's the best you can do. There's no answer, we have no answer for anybody but Jesus. And so God is the power, and the power's through prayer. And I encourage you to do that. And I thank God for this congregation. I will always, always be grateful because of you. So thank you. Thank you, dear. There you go. You see what I mean? Didn't she look incredible on that screen? <laughs> Amen. All right. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, where I want to minister from. And I want to preach a sermon tonight that I think characterizes what our ministry is all about, has always been what our ministry uh, is all about. Way back when Pastor Mitchell moved to Prescott and began to reach these young, uh, desperate people during the Jesus People Movement, uh, to Pastor Warner uh, coming here to Tucson, and him and Mona, uh, he and Mona beginning to witness. They used to uh, go from their house uh, down to Puebla High School and just begin to witness, and I believe the very first converts of the church came out of that, uh, uh, that witnessing. Uh, and so I want to preach this sermon again that I think characterizes because God takes the irrelevant and makes them relevant. We've been made aware of what I think is an amazing story, at least from a preacher's uh, point of view. It really got my attention. And I feel a little bit, or I will feel a little bit like Pastor Richard Ruby because I'm going to use a number of sports illustrations tonight. And uh, don't tell him about one of them that I'm going to use. Um, the term that we started hearing last year, sometime around December, and it kind of... Uh, uh, increase to a crescendo uh, going into the NFL playoffs uh, was the term Mr. Irrelevant. You may remember that. Mr. Irrelevant is the name given to the last man chosen in the NFL draft. The NFL draft uh, takes place every year at the end of April. All 32 teams have an opportunity in a particular order to pick the best player they think is available 
Uh, at that time, there are 32 teams. There are about eight rounds. In other words, each team has eight picks. They go through all 32 teams, then start again, go through them again. And uh, most of the attention, or really all of the attention, uh, is on the first round, uh, usually the first 10 players, uh, especially numbers one, two, three, et cetera, the top player drafted, supposedly the very best, uh, the elite. Uh, he's a certain success. Uh, and then the deeper you get into the draft, uh, into the third round, the fourth round, the fifth round, uh, nobody pays attention anymore. Brock Purdy was the 2022 designee, Mr. Irrelevant. They actually have a kind of a thing they do for Mr. Irrelevant. As soon as he's announced, uh, some organization, I don't know who it is, but they take him on a big vacation because they figure this guy's not going nowhere. He's drafted 262. So they give him a big vacation, him and his family, and a, I don't know if they give him a trophy for that or not, but uh, they kind of acknowledge it. Mr. Irrelevant. He was the first Mr. Irrelevant to complete a forward pass in a regular season game against the Kansas City Chiefs of all teams. During week seven of the 2022 season, later that season, in week 13, he became the first Mr. Irrelevant to ever throw a touchdown pass in a regular season game in a 33-17 win against the Miami Dolphins. The following week, he became the first rookie quarterback to beat Tom Brady. Richard Ruby will like that part of the illustration. In his first career, he also managed a two-yard rushing score, becoming the first Mr. Irrelevant quarterback to do so. Purdy would finish out the season with four more wins, thus beginning his career 5-0. and oh and capping off a 10-game winning streak uh, by the San Francisco 49ers to close out the season. He became the first Mr. Irrelevant quarterback to feature in as well as start and win a playoff game when the 49ers defeated the Seattle Seahawks 41-23. And then uh, during the, that was during the wild card round. And then he became the first Mr. Irrelevant uh, uh, quarterback to make it to the division round uh, when the 49ers defeated the Dallas Cowboys 19 to 12 on January 22nd. Mr. Irrelevant. Well, Mr. Irrelevant became pretty relevant, didn't he? And you know what? The Bible is full of Mr. Irrelevance, and so too is this church. People who may have been once labeled, once branded, maybe it's how you thought of yourself. I have no real skill, no real talent. I don't know if I can ever achieve or ever amount to anything significant in my life, but God majors in taking Mr. and Miss Irrelevant and making them relevant. And that's going to be the theme of my message this evening. And I want you to turn your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to read verse 1 and then skip down to verse. Six. So follow with me. It's a very familiar story. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesli the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And then skip down to verse 6. And so it was... Uh, when they came that Samuel looked at all the sons of Jesse, and he first looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord looks on the outward appearance, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. 
And Samuel said, Are all the young men here? Then Jesse said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, uh, keeping the sheep, Mr. Irrelevant. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought David in. He was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. I want to talk, first of all, about this label or the label Mr. Irrelevant. The term Mr. Irrelevant was the term that was designated for this football player that we're talking about, Brock Purdy. You can become a prisoner to a label or how you have been labeled in life. Many of you perhaps grew up with parents or schoolmates or people at work uh, labeling you. You're the least. You're never going to amount to anything. You're not the wisest. You're not the sharpest. You're not the smartest. And you can become a, a prisoner to a label. Every player that is drafted into the NFL is studied and a scouting report is written based on his perceived strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes they can be very accurate. This is why some places uh, are, uh, some players are drafted first uh, and others are drafted last. Some have uh, uh, extraordinary speed or arm strength or mobility or size uh, or just incredible athleticism. Uh, all the scouting reports that have poured in uh, uh, designate this individual uh, as a surefire success. Uh, and then you get deeper and deeper and deeper into the draft uh, and you end up with players uh, uh, not so strong, uh, doesn't have arm strength, uh, has good qualities and abilities, uh, but has all of these negatives against his life. But what we find out with scouting reports uh, is that they can be terribly wrong, as was the case with Brock Purdy. Samuel's reading a scouting report, apparently, and he determines that Eliab should be drafted first. He's the biggest the oldest, the strongest, a trained warrior. Uh, He has experience. uh, And the Bible says, so it was uh, when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely, 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 the Lord's anointed is before me. And the Bible says that Samuel looked at Eliab. Uh, It must have been quite a look. I mean, he must have been quite a specimen. I don't know if he looked like the rock that Hollywood actor, or what he looked like. Uh, But, I mean, he must have been outwardly incredibly impressive uh, above all of his brothers that were there. And God had to rebuke his prophet. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. It's almost like God is saying, what is wrong with you? You should know better than this, Samuel, that God looks at the heart. He doesn't see as man sees. He doesn't look at outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. David was thus labeled Mr. Irrelevant. He's the least. He couldn't possibly be the one. Jesse didn't even call him uh, uh, into the showing there. He belongs at the very bottom. He's the youngest, he's the weakest, and he's the least. So Jesse called Abinadab in verse 8 and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither is the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass. And he said, neither is the Lord chosen this one. It's no, 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 and no. None of these are the ones uh, that, uh, that God has called to be the future king of Israel. And as far as all of them are concerned, including Jesse, David is the least. Don't even bother calling him forward. And then Samuel said to Jesse in verse 11, are all the young men here? 
Are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. It's, it's very dismissive. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. That word, the youngest, is not just referring to age, but it's a derogatory label. It means small or lesser, least or insignificant or unimportant. Yeah, there he is there. I have one more son, but he's Mr. Irrelevant. He's the, look at all these boys I've got. Look at all these tall, strapping, uh, strong, well-trained, well-disciplined uh, young men. Uh, he shouldn't even be in the same room with them. But you know what? God has his own labels. And God sees what we don't. And this is such uh, an important uh, statement uh, that characterizes uh, Pastor Warner's ministry, uh, how he went about reaching the lost and still does. Uh, the Lord does not see as man sees. I was an undesirable. You saw the picture. I don't understand, and I'm being facetious here, why my father-in-law was upset that I was marrying his daughter. Can you see the problem? She's 18 years old. I'm 18. I marry her. We get in a 1963 Impala and drive up to Oregon where we're going to live with a bunch of hippies. Why did he have a problem with that? It's a mystery. But God sees something that we don't. God sees that this young man has a relationship with God. He has integrity. And he exhibits all of those qualities when nobody is looking. A lot of people behave badly when nobody's looking. Uh, but when nobody was looking, David behaved admirably. Uh, he exhibited great uh, uh, exhibitions of faith. Uh, God has a different criteria. He sees what can happen if he gets a hold of Mr. Irrelevant's life. And he sees what a woman or a man can become. I want to talk secondly about how you see yourself. 261 Players were chosen before Brock Purdy. That can be a pretty big hit on your ego. He's chosen last. His name is broadcast, and now, finally, we're at the very last player drafted in the 2022 draft, and his name is Brock Purdy, and immediately the press starts running. Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. Tom Brady, this is what I don't want you to tell Pastor Ruby about. <laughs> Tom Brady was drafted 199th in the sixth round of the NFL draft. Uh, he quarterbacked for Michigan and had quite a successful career, and estimates were that he was going to be drafted in the second round, which is pretty good. It's pretty high up there. First round, nothing. Second round, nothing. Third round, nothing. He was so embarrassed. He was sitting around his family, as they do on these occasions, waiting for the big announcement. But after three rounds, and his name isn't mentioned, he leaves the room. He's embarrassed. He's ashamed. And then the fourth and the fifth round. And then he's chosen 199th by the New England Patriots. But he didn't see himself as a sixth round, 199th draft pick. He wrote, or so, when somebody was writing his biography, they mentioned uh, the first time he met uh, uh, the owner of the team, Robert Kraft. Uh, he walked up to Robert Kraft uh, and introduced himself, sir, I I'm Tom Brady. And he said, I know who you are. You were drafted 199th in the sixth round. And Tom Brady immediately fired back uh, and said, I am going to be the best decision you ever made. He didn't see himself as number 199. He called his agent during that first year when he was fourth string quarterback. 
He called his agent and said, I want to buy a house. I love Boston. And I want to buy, and the agent said, whoa, pump the brakes a little bit. You're probably not going to be on that team in the next year, two, or three. You'll bounce around the league. It'll take a while to get you to fit in. And it usually takes four, five, six years to get a starting. No, 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 no. This is my last stop. I'm going to end up quarterbacking this team. I want to buy a house here. It's very important how you see yourself. David saw himself as someone who could slay a giant. He didn't see himself the way his father had labeled him as the youngest. He didn't see himself as his brothers had dismissed him as irrelevant. The youngest, the least. And so now we're at the site of the battle. David has run an errand for his father. That's what he's good for. Run an errand for your dad. Take these goods to your brothers. Find out what's happening in the battle. Give this food to their uh, commanders uh, and then come back and give me a report. Uh, But when he comes onto the battlefield, uh, he sees what's going on. The giant Goliath uh, is there, the Philistine giant mocking the children of Israel uh, and challenging someone uh, to come out and fight. Uh, And David, this year, young mystery relevant is incredulous Uh, what is happening Uh, is there not a cause Uh, why doesn't someone go out and fight now Eliab his oldest brother first Samuel 17 heard when David spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was aroused against David and he said why did you come here and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, uh, for you have come down to see the battle. Eliab sees him as Mr. Irrelevant. What are you doing here? You don't belong here. This is where men are. This is where warriors are. This is where people come uh, who fight. And David's question is simply, well, then why aren't you fighting? (laughs) Mr. Irrelevant is not what God sees in David. And he could have been as young as 15 years old at the time. God sees someone who could take out a giant, and David saw himself as that. You know, the Bible is filled with Mr. Irrelevance that God used. And the lesson is, don't let the world label you. Don't label yourself Mr. or Miss Irrelevant, there was a harlot in the city of Jericho. This was the first city that the children of Israel were charged to conquer when they went into the promised land and spies went into the city. She's a harlot. What kind of a place in God's economy does a woman like that have? She's not even Jewish. She's irrelevant as are all the citizens of Jericho. She heard the spies out, hid them, had heard the reports of when the children of Israel left Egypt and the Red Sea and all the miracle power that was upon them. And she said, the whole city is terrified because of you. And then she asks a favor. Will you save my life? Will you preserve me for the fact that I'm helping you? And they said that they would if she would get her whole family into the house and hang a scarlet thread, a scarlet string or rope out of the window, they will save her. And we know that Ahab gets folded into the lineage of Jesus Christ, and their irrelevant becomes relevant. We have the account in the book of Ruth, who is a Moabite, Ruth is. These are traditional, historical enemies of Israel. We know the story. She returns back to Israel with her mother-in-law after her mother-in-law and her husband had fled. And then her mother-in-law's husband died. Her husband dies. And then they're going back to Israel. She has no future in Israel. She's not Jewish. She's Moabitish. 
She's going to be rejected. She's going to be prejudiced against. She's going to be maligned. It's going to be very hard for her to live in Israel. And when Boaz met her, when she went to glean in his field, he had to tell the young man, you stay away from her. She's very attractive, very beautiful. She's Moabitish. And there's no question that she was going to be abused by the young men. And so Boaz had to push back on them. We know the story how she ended up marrying Boaz. And she becomes the grandmother, actually, of Jesse, uh, or rather the mother of Jesse and the grandmother of King David, and also folded into the lineage of Jesus Christ, Moses. We view him as an incredible man of faith, but he contributed to his own irrelevancy uh, by killing an Egyptian soldier uh, and then having to flee Israel, uh, or Egypt rather, for 40 years. Uh, He wandered in the backside of the wilderness uh, and became irrelevant. And then God visited him through the burning bush and brought him back as a powerful deliverer. We have the account of Gideon. In Judges chapter 6, verse 14, then the Lord turned to Gideon and said, this is when they were uh, under siege or under attack uh, constantly by the by the Midianites, uh, and, uh, and they're in fear. The Midianites, uh, as soon as the children of Israel would sow their crops, the Midianites would come and ruin and spoil the fields. And they were hiding in caves, and they were fearful. And then the Lord appeared to him and said, Gideon, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So Gideon said, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest, and I am the least. I'm irrelevant. I don't matter. He saw himself that way, but he won a great victory for the Lord because God saw him otherwise. We have the account of Mephibosheth. He bowed himself before David, the king at that time, many years after from where we're reading in 2 Samuel 9. He bowed himself before the king and said, what is your servant? Who am I that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And then David blessed him and said, you are going to eat at my table uh, like one of the king's sons. He lifted him uh, out of obscurity uh, and gave him a seat at the king's table. Jesus' disciples, they're not the superstars. They're not the highest ranking. They're not the best, the most talented. They're basically nondescript men, irrelevant They're not great influencers. Most of these men would have had a very small circle of of relationship and friends. Uh, They're in no position of power and no position of authority. uh, And yet Jesus chose them uh, as his disciples. uh, And now we read still today the books they read. uh, We read the accounts of their great great exploits uh, as God used them to build the church and extend his kingdom on earth. David didn't see himself as Mr. Irrelevant. And this is very, very important. Because if you see yourself as Mr. Irrelevant, that may very well be what you will always be. You can be bound in a prison cell of your own label for yourself. The scouting report said David's weak. He's too young, too inexperienced. He's the least. That's how Gideon, the one I just read about, that's how he thought of himself, Saul, before he was made king. That's how he thought of himself. I'm the least. I'm the weakest. I'm the most insignificant. And God had to convince these individuals otherwise when Samuel was getting ready to pronounce Saul to be the first king of Israel. And Samuel makes it known in 1 Samuel 9, 21. And Saul answered Samuel and said, I am a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes, and my family is the least of the tribes of Benjamin. Why then do you speak like this to me that I'm going to be a king? Made no sense to him. I'm small, I'm least, I'm irrelevant. But how many know God has his own scouting reports? He could look at a long-haired hippie like I once was and see something more and better than everyone else did. And by the way, 
as a consequence of my conversion and the radical change that took place in my life, uh, my father-in-law got saved, my mother-in-law got saved and gave their lives to Christ. Took some convincing, but they eventually did. First Samuel 10. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further. Has the man come here yet? Referring to Saul, Samuel has announced he's going to be king. And the Lord answered, there he is, uh, hidden among the equipment. This is all making him very nervous that he's going to be king. I don't belong there. It's not my place. I, uh, uh, who am I? So they ran and brought Saul from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. That's not how Saul saw himself, but that's how God saw him at that time. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. You have to learn to see yourself as God sees you and to see people around you as God sees them. They're not losers. They're not hopeless. They're not the least and the weakest. So let's get back to the battlefield. David stepped out of the shadow of how his father and his brothers were labeling him. Satan wants to label you. And you could even be sitting here tonight and you've been bombarded with the lying voice of our adversary uh, who has said you're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. You've had too many disadvantages. You come from a busted, broken home. You've been in prison, in and out of trouble all your life. Uh, what makes you think you can sit here in this great church uh, and, and, and be anybody of influence? The devil bombards us with how irrelevant he wants to label us. The brothers saw him one way, but he himself, David saw himself as someone who could defeat a giant that no one else was, I can do this, he thought. He's this ruddy, let's say 15-year-old shepherd boy and then he tells Saul when Saul heard that David was talking about why isn't somebody fighting the giant? Saul heard about that and called for him and said, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion uh, and from the paw of the bear, he told Saul uh, uh, a story about how he was tending sheep and a lion came and he killed him uh, and a bear came and he killed a bear. And, and, and David is saying, look, uh, uh, as the bear and the lion were before me, so will this giant be. The Lord will go with me. And David's confidence there is not pride. It's not arrogance. It's not a false sense of importance. What he's doing is aligning himself with how God saw him. He's not buying the label that his father had or that his brothers had or that Satan had. He's aligning himself with how God saw him. And this may be one of the most important features uh, in your development as a Christian, uh, seeing yourself as God sees you. Yeah, I know we say we were unworthy, undeserving, unfit, uh, and yet Jesus saw you as worthy uh, of dying for. We sacrifice at the highest level for things that we think are worth that sacrifice. That's how he saw you. So there's one more hurdle to overcome, backing up a little bit, and that was Saul's labeling of him. When the Philistine, or when Saul first saw David, he said, no. You're just a young kid. You're unfit. You're unable. You're just a youth. He's a man of war from his youth. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go out against the Philistine to fight. I mean, that's, that's his uh, final verdict on David when he saw him untrained, not a warrior. He's surrounded by all these men of war. Saul 
So he has one more hurdle to overcome, and that is Goliath himself. So Goliath also saw David as Mr. Irrelevant. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth. There's that word again. And the Philistine said to David, come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. You know, it's always interesting to me uh, how definitive and certain uh, the people are who want to label you. I'm going to destroy you. You're the least. You're no good. You're irrelevant. You'll never amount to anything. But David refused to label. He didn't see himself the way Jesse, his father, labeled him, the way his brothers labeled him, and the way Goliath was now labeled. He doesn't, he refuses to be influenced by that. And then David said to the Philistine in 1 Samuel 17, you come to me with a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you. This is what's coming down today. The Lord is going to deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. It makes all the difference in the world when you see yourself as God sees you. If David had bought into the labeling of Jesse, the labeling of his brothers, the labeling of Saul, and the labeling of Goliath, he would have run for his life and crawled into irrelevancy, but he refuses to see himself that way. I want to close by talking to you about the benefits of being Mr. Irrelevant. The ones you think are going to be great, very often they're busts. Many of the first rounders don't make it. And they bounce around, never starting. Pastor Warner used to always say, God is not looking for superstars. Anyone here back when in the 70s, he may still be saying that now regularly, God is not. He had to say that because he's looking out at us. (laughs) God doesn't look at the outward, not as man sees. In 1998, uh, Ryan Leaf was the quarterback of the Washington State Cougars. Peyton Manning was the quarterback for uh, Tennessee, right, Tennessee. And they were going to be one or two. Ryan Leaf won, Peyton Manning two, or Peyton Manning won, and Ryan Leaf two. Of course, Peyton Manning was a Great success, went on to be a Hall of Fame quarterback, recently retired in the last several years. Ryan Leaf was selected as the second overall pick, number two of all the college players in the country, the number two best player, quarterback. He was drafted by the San Diego Chargers. His career was shortened due to poor play, bad behavior, injuries, struggles with his work ethic, none of that was in the scouting report. They are just looking at the outward. Some of those things that I just mentioned, uh, bad behavior, uh, struggles with his work ethic, uh, and his ability to stay focused, those are internal dynamics. He got addicted to gambling while he was in college. He only lasted four years, played for four different teams, only started, uh, I think, 12 or 13 games, uh, and by the fourth year, he was out of the NFL. Since then, because of his gambling addiction, uh, he spent many years in prison, divorces, just a messed up life. But he was number two drafted. They thought, this guy is going to be the one. Going back a little further, some of you may remember uh, Art Schlichter was the quarterback of Ohio State back in the late 70s, early 80s. He was drafted number four in 1982, Art Schlichter. No, this is the one that had the gambling addiction, sorry. Ryan Leaf was just the one with no work ethic and couldn't stay focused. Got my illustrations mixed up here. Not as good at this as Richard Ruby is giving sports illustrations. 
But anyway, Art Schlichter is the one who got addicted to gambling during his college career, drafted number four in 1982, only played for four years, uh, started 13 games. Uh, his professional career was cut short by a gambling addiction uh, and that resulted uh, in him facing legal, legal trouble uh, uh, for the rest of his life. He just got out of prison a few, I think last year uh, again, but uh, never made it. Samuel bought into the scouting reports as some of those guys did. And it's no surprise to God that David was the one. One of my favorite scriptures, because Pastor Warner used to use it so much, was 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise uh, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak. Yes, amen things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to, to bring to nothing the things that are. I remember Pastor Warner preaching that, uh, using that, te and I'm out there saying, yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's what we are. Uh, we were labeled weak. We were labeled foolish. Uh, we were labeled unwise. But look what God is doing with our lives today. So I mentioned at the beginning of this final point, the benefits of being Mr. Irrelevant. How can it be a benefit to be drafted 262? Well, why don't you ask Brock Purdy that now? Number one, being told no, or being told you're the youngest or the weakest, creates resilience. I ought to prove myself. I am not that. I am not Mr. Irrelevant. That's what David is doing on that battlefield. I'm going to show them that there's a God in heaven who can use my life to take out a giant. They say that Tom Brady plays with a chip on his shoulder because he got dissed <clears throat> during the draft and drafted 199. He wants to prove everybody wrong. You know, when things don't come easy for you, when you have to scratch and you have to claw and you have to grind your way forward, that's what builds metal. That's what builds stamina and conditioning for a long, successful campaign. You're the least, you're the youngest. No, I'm not. And I'm going to demonstrate that God can help me become something that I could never become on my own. With God's help, with God's grace, with God's favor, with God's blessing, I have what it takes to take down giants. Some of the first rounders in the draft, they've been told for years how great you are. How, look, at the, look at the scouting report. You're, you're just a marvel to behold. And they're handed everything. And everything comes easy, and they get drafted first or second or eighth or tenth. And their path is made easier by everyone around them. But sometimes they bust because resilience, tenacity, as I described my wife as having, a, is necessary for success. Being handed everything on your own terms is a recipe for failure. Life doesn't allow you to get everything on your own terms. Secondly, obstacles, problems, mountains, and giants need to be viewed by Mr. Irrelevant as great opportunities. David saw Goliath as an opportunity to glorify God and to demonstrate his superiority. 1 Samuel 17, all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword or the spear. He's got something to present to God his faith. He's got something to demonstrate to, to all the children of Israel and the Philistines and this giant uh, that there is a God in heaven uh, and he's going to give this victory. And David was the instrument for that to occur. You need to view your problems that way. Your problems, your mountains, your giants, the dark clouds that you may think you're living underneath, 
rather than barriers that are going to hinder you and prevent. Uh, they are opportunities to overcome and glorify God. This is how we all have viewed Pastor Warner all these many years. We don't cower in the face of giants and obstacles because we've watched him face giants and move mountains and remain in place for your benefit and for my benefit, continuing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do not have to accept the world's labels. God has a scouting report for you. Life can beat you down present you with so many disadvantages. You reach uh, many of the very same people that we reach, kids that have been violated, abused, rejected by both parents, raised uh, in foster homes. Just uh, they come into the church and they're so, they're so broken and so crushed and so dysfunctional. They can't see themselves uh, as anything that could be a success uh, or anything that can wield any measure of influence. Uh, they've been wallowing so long uh, in the dark shadows of life, they just can't see it. But God says no. The prodigal son, he essentially said, I have become Mr. Irrelevant because of my foolish decision to leave my father's house and squander my inheritance. And the Bible says he came to himself and he says, I'm going back to my father's house as Mr. Irrelevant. I'll just be a servant. And God says, no. You're coming back not as a backslider. I don't like it when Christians six months later after someone has returned to church still referring to them, oh, there's that backslider. No, no, they're not a backslider. They're a son just like you're a son. They're a daughter just, yeah, they messed up. They violated, they blew it, they sinned, they hurt people in the church, but they're back, they're sons and they're daughters once again. How about letting God's word label you? Yet in all things, we are more than conquerors. How's that for a label? <laughs> Through him who loved us, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not the weakest. I'm not the least. I am who I am because of Jesus Christ in me. Brock Purdy said these words recently, football is a game and it's my job for sure. And I take it very seriously, but at the end of the day, I know that I am not defined by wins or losses as a person that is not who I am. I'm not just a quarterback. I wasn't born just to be a quarterback and to play football, and that's it. I have a life. He said this while at Iowa State. He said that he asked God to forgive him. He played his football in college at Iowa State. He asked God to forgive him while he was playing there for putting the sport of football that he loved very much ahead of his relationship with God. And it was just a reminder, he said, of where my identity is, uh, where it lies, he said, and that is in Jesus Christ. And I continued to lean on him again the next day. I didn't go out and throw for 500 yards and was this awesome quarterback, uh, but it was just this peace that I had uh, with Jesus knowing that I had rededicated my life to him. Hey, no matter what I'm going to face moving forward during football, God and Jesus are going to be my identity. And whatever I face, I won't be shaken from it. I've got a great foundation in him. That tells me that Mr. Irrelevant was never that, not ever. He always was relevant as a child of God, always destined for impact and greatness, however that may be defined going forward, and so too are you. Can we give God praise this evening? <laughs> Amen. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm, I can't tell you how grateful Renee and I are for the invitation to be here with you today. 
For me, it's been such a worthwhile experience and exercise. Renee and I have been talking about it for days. We've got our conference coming up a week from tomorrow, so please be praying for that. So we're consumed with a lot of things going on, but we've been talking about this, talking about it all day today. I'm sure we'll talk about it on the way back to the hotel tonight and tomorrow, and I'll be testifying to my church on Wednesday. And I just want to thank all of you and thank Pastor Warner again. But before we get to anything else, perhaps you are here tonight, and maybe that's you. You've been kicked to the curb, broken, crushed, rejected. Sometimes by the time young people are 15, 18 years old, they've had a lifetime of trauma and tragedy and brokenness. And if you've lived beyond those teenage years and you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s or beyond, even more so. Life can make you feel so irrelevant. Sin makes you feel irrelevant. Maybe the people that you run with make you feel irrelevant. But Jesus doesn't see you that way. He first of all sees you as a candidate to become a son. Full-fledged son, full-fledged daughter, fully adopted and loved by God as much as he loves anyone else. There's level ground. I've always loved that phrase. There's level ground at the foot of the cross. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you repent of your sins, you get equal footing with me before the cross. I've been serving God for 48 years, but that doesn't make me better than anybody else. The brand newest convert, the person who gives their life to Christ tonight, we're on equal footing. I'm your bro once you give your life to Jesus. We're part of the same family going to heaven together. And so maybe that describes you, and maybe this sermon helped you see a different perspective of life tonight. You're not what the world has labeled you. You're not what friends, maybe family, people at work, and bullies at school have labeled you. A loser. Weak, young, inexperienced, never amount to anything. You're a child of God who has the power that once you align yourself with how God sees you, you have the power to take down giants and to overcome and to be victorious in your life, to experience real peace and real joy and real victory. So as our heads are bowed tonight and our eyes are closed, perhaps you've come, and maybe this is the very sermon you needed to hear. And God's all over you tonight, and you're ready. You're so ready for this. And you're ready to say yes to Jesus, yes to allowing him to forgive your sin, and yes to receiving him as your Lord and Savior. And if that describes you tonight, I want to ask you just to do one simple thing so that I can say a prayer for you. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I want to just ask you to lift your hand up right where you're seated, please. Lift it high. There's nothing. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. Anyone else tonight, lift your hand right up. God bless you guys. Way in the back there, I see that hand. Thank you very much. Anyone else tonight, God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. As much as I'm so enjoying seeing people from the years in the church, I want to see people saved tonight. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. I want to see people for the first time giving their lives to Jesus and having the experience that Renee and I had 48 years ago. You can meet Jesus. Your sins can be forgiven. Your life can be changed. You can be born again. And there's nothing like it in all the world. Nothing. And at the end of life, you get heaven. And during this life, you can live a life of significance and meaning and joy and peace and victory. Would you join these several that have already lifted their hands tonight, if you haven't already done so, and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to get my heart right. Yes, I see your hand. God bless you. You can put it down. You can. Yes, I see those hands. Thank you very much. Maybe you're backslidden. You know, sometimes life can kick you in the teeth and we fall under a dark cloud of the devil's accusation. See, I told you you're a failure. I told you you couldn't live for God. You backslid, you sinned, you did wrong. And the devil says, look at you, you pathetic, 
excuse for a Christian. Don't bother going back to church. Don't bother trying. You're going to fail. Listen, that's the biggest lie of hell. And maybe you've managed to stumble and stagger and get your way back to church, and that pretty much describes you. The arms of the Lord Jesus Christ are waiting for you to come back home. Would you lift your hand right now? Pastor, that is me. I'm backslidden. I've gone astray. I've sinned. I've blown it. And I've made myself irrelevant, but I believe Jesus can help me tonight and I can recapture his destiny for my life. Would you slip your hand right up and put it right back down? Okay, we had several people lift their hands way in the back there. Uh, I want you to come. Yes, amen. I want you to come right now. We're going to pray with you. Over here on my right, you lifted your hand. Further on my right, lift your head if you looked, if you lifted. God bless you. Amen. We want to pray with you. Would you come and let us pray with you? There's a sister who's going to meet you here. I need a sister to come. Maybe Julie, you could come with her right to your left there. Brother in the back. Others have lifted their hands. The ushers are going to have to help me tonight as you come and find a place to pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. God's going to help you tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, son. God's going to help you tonight. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming. Amen. Just spread out a little bit. Find a place to pray. Make sure there's someone praying with everyone. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Maybe there's another here. You've seen these come. Why don't you come tonight? There's no, don't let pride. People think, well, I'll, I'll do this later. This is the best opportunity you'll have. I'm not saying the only opportunity, but this is the best opportunity to ha- that you have to get your heart right with God that's being presented to you right now. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you guys. Amen. Right over here. Amen. They're still coming. Amen. Anyone else tonight? We'll wait all night if we have to. We won't, but... It's, that's how important this is tonight. If you're still out there and you haven't gotten your heart right with God, you can come now. I remember Pastor Warner telling me when I was on staff as door director that he pulled an altar call for as long as he did just for the one person that he knew was there that wasn't right with God. He knew they were wrestling and he was just trying to be an instrument of God to, to get them to respond. And I want that spirit in every one of my altar calls tonight. This is life and death, heaven and hell. You can't just blow through an altar call. We have to press. We're doing battle tonight for the souls of men and women. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Don't let anyone or anything label you Mr. Irrelevant. You're not that. Maybe you're living under a dark cloud of many problems and pressures, and you can hardly do much more than come to church occasionally. Listen, you need to read God's scouting report for you. You're a child of God. You're more than a conqueror. You are strengthened with power by his might in the inner man. There's nothing too hard for God. No one beyond his reach. You know, this altar tonight, this altar call should be a place, I think, of surrender. Lord, I am surrendering to your scouting report for my life. From this day forward, I'm going to believe that I can slay giants and move mountains. I'm going to believe that I can come out from underneath the dark clouds that I'm living under and have victory and dominion in my life. And again, Pastor Warner is such a good example of that. The Christian life is transcendent, meaning that you can live above some of the restrictions and restraints and problems and challenges and difficulties that we have to deal with in life and still maintain our joy, still maintain our victory and dominion in life. 
So let's all stand tonight. Enough said. Let's stand. Why don't you make your way to the altar? Let's make it a place of surrender. God, I'm surrendering to your scouting report for my life. Uh, You see me as a champion. That's how I'm going to see myself. You see me as more than a conqueror. That's how I'm going to see myself tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good tonight. Oh, find a place to pray. Get a hold of God. Surrender to him. Lord, I am going to break the stranglehold of the label that I've been thinking myself as. I am not, nor have I ever been, nor will I be in the future, Mr. Irrelevant or Miss Irrelevant. I'm going to believe God is going to use my life. God is going to help me. God is going to give me joy and peace and victory and dominion in my life. This isn't a pep rally tonight. I'm speaking truth and I'm speaking revelation. David refused to accept the label of his father and his brothers, King Saul and Goliath, and saw himself as more than a conqueror, saw himself as a giant slayer. And you know what? That's what he became. That's what he became. Let's sing, worship God as you're crying out to the Lord tonight. Yes, Lord. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hand. This evening, rather, let's all stand. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. God has good things for your life. Amen and amen. Young man, did you just give your life to Christ now, or have you been saved? You've been saved. You have a lot of disadvantages in your life. That's what God wants me to tell you. But they're going to become as a distant memory. Right now, they're kind of in front of you, and you think about them a lot. Some of the disadvantages that you've had in your life. Does that make sense to you? You're going to be an overcomer. You're going to want to be one of the strongest overcomers for youth when they see your life. Can you see yourself that way? Don't let your past label you. Your past failures, don't let them be what identifies you. God has an identity for you. As a son, as more than a conqueror, did I mention that scripture tonight? As a giant slayer, as a mover of mountains. You need to see yourself the way God sees you, and that's going to revolutionize your whole life. Father, touch this young man, Lord, I pray the hand of God. 
Oh, God, I pray your destiny, your purpose and will revealed, oh God, layer by layer uh, in the days and weeks and months ahead, oh God, I pray, Father, for your grace and your favor and your blessing uh, and your anointing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Sister, you're, would you stand and let me pray for you? Amen. You gave your life to Christ tonight. Amen. You see yourself as someone who life has passed you by. You see yourself as a failure, and all you see in the future is dark. You've thought of taking your life even. I don't know that you would do that, but you've had kind of a death wish. I wish I'd never been born. I wish I'd never lived. That's all going to change. You believe that? Yes, I do. You believe Jesus can change your life. If he can do in me what he's done, he can do it in anybody. Amen. You need to see yourself the way God sees you. You're a daughter of God as a consequence of giving your life to him as much as any other sister in this congregation. You need to plug into this church, start serving God, build relationships, and you watch what God's going to do. Father, touch my sister right now. Lord, I pray the hand of grace would overshadow her life. Oh, God, make yourself real to her. I break the power of every curse, oh, God, every word spoken against her. I bind every lying voice of the adversary right now, and I pray the peace and the joy and the victory of the Lord right now in Jesus' name. Let's give God praise. Oh, I preached a sermon on suicide. I, I, I do it about once a year because I was quite shocked when I preached it in my church in July of 2018. As I'm preaching the sermon, uh, it was a sermon about depression, about oppression, uh, uh, discouragement uh, and how that can lead to a death wish uh, or wanting to take your life or actually taking your life uh, and there was such a unique anointing on that message it, it was like the church was spellbound nobody moved I was just simply laying out what God had put in my heart uh, and I made an appeal for people to come to the altar and I was shocked not at not at people that would commit suicide but how many people had a death wish numbers of great men of God in the Bible said things like, I wish I'd never been born, nobody's serving God, why was I ever born, why did it happen, Job, Elisha, many, many others, because life wasn't going their way. Life wasn't going their way. God needs to help us tonight. This is a generation of young people that is underneath the stranglehold of those kind of lying voices, depression and oppression and suicide and, and death wishes and all kinds of craziness, people living very reckless because they don't care whether they live or die. We have a message for this generation, can you say amen? And it's a message of hope. It's a message that whatever disadvantages you've experienced in your life, however broken you may be, that can be put into the dustbin of history. I'm not identified by all the horrible things I did before I got saved. I'm identified, my beginning started on May 22nd, 1975, when I was born again. And I want you to bow your heads with me tonight, and I want to pray for people. I know I didn't preach on it, and this is a little bit of an unusual way to finish the sermon the service tonight, but I want to pray for people tonight that feel that. You feel oppressed? You feel depressed? I want every head bowed, please. I'm not going to proceed until I see every head bowed. People need privacy because I'm going to ask for a show of hands tonight. You've been oppressed and depressed and felt like quitting and giving up, and part of it may be related to what I preached. Uh, the devil's been hammering you with your irrelevancy or the accusation or the label that you're irrelevant, but you're not that. You're a child of the living God. You have every reason to have dignity, to feel good about yourself and your position in the kingdom of God. 
And uh, if the devil has been hammering you and you've been through a period of, and a season maybe of oppression, I want you just to lift your hand and acknowledge that and say, God, I need you to touch me tonight. I need the victory that pastor's preaching about. I want to see myself from this day forward as more than a conqueror. Pray with me, all of you together. Even if you didn't raise your hand, I want you to pray with me. God in heaven, I thank you tonight for the power that is in the blood of Jesus that washes over my heart and my mind and cleanses me from everything that is not of God in my life. Every attitude, every thought, every imagination that is contrary to love and to faith and to holiness and righteousness. I am a child of the living God. I am more than a conqueror. That is my identity. And from this day forward, I am embracing that. And I break the curse of oppression and depression. I cast it out of my life, and I lay claim to the joy and the peace of God that is my portion. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's give God praise tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's praise God one more time. Hallelujah. Oh, My prayer tonight is that a a deposit was made in your life that's going to live in the days and weeks ahead. I'm the sum total of many hundreds, thousands of deposits that have been made in my life over many, many years, and I'm still receiving them. I want to once again thank Pastor and Mona just for the gracious invitation to come and be able to minister on this uh, Jubilee Sunday. We're so thankful and grateful as Renee uh, reiterated. God bless you all, and we'll be back for conference. Be praying for our conference uh, that starts one week from uh, tomorrow, and we'll be sending Pastor and the staff here all the announcements. We're believing God for great things. Amen. Let's thank the Lord one more time. God, praise God. What a wonderful day we've had, the Jubilee, and uh, amen. It doesn't finish. We are moving tomorrow into the men's discipleship class. If you're a man, please do join us. Uh, uh, there will be some gathered from other churches in the area that will be with us. Uh, you know, I remember the first time that uh, there was a discipleship class in Tucson, and uh, I didn't go. And the next day I had a brother say, why weren't you there last night? And I said, well, I, didn't, I don't think I qualify as a disciple yet. Uh, he said, no, it's for you, so you can qualify. It's for you. Men, young men, come be there. Uh, it's going to be a glorious time. We'll be gathered together and have a great time. Uh, also, prayer in the week. Amen. If you're free in the mornings, come and pray with us. Uh, uh, amen. We pray from 6 to 9, the building's open. As our heads are bow bowed, uh, uh, amen. I'm going to ask our brother Richard Dominguez just to close us in prayer.